and Steve Cole is a professor of medicine and psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences in the UCLA School of Medicine. He studies the molecular pathways uh, that make uh, by which social environments influence gene expression by viral cancer and immune cell genomes and develops the necessary bioinformatic tools to conduct this kind of work. Dr. Cole's research has mapped the pathways by which social factors enhance replication of viruses, HIV-1 and HHV-8, after expression of key immune response genes, for example, IL-6 and INFB, IFNB, and upregulate cancer progression and metastases, for example, in breast and ovarian cancers. Dr. Cole earned his PhD in psychology from Stanford and did his postdoc in psychoneuroimmunology at UCLA and ever since has been helping to lead well-being science through a very long and varied list of prestigious scholarly roles and an even longer list of critical achievements and publications. Steve's work has and continues to shape how we think about the interplay between social, uh, social life and lifelong health. So I am going to, for a moment, share this, and then I'm going to invite Steve to actually take over sharing. It says I cannot screen share while the other participant is screen sharing. Okay, let me stop then. I thought it would let you just take over. <laughs> Let's see. Now it works. Good job. So folks, uh, thanks for joining me today. I'm gonna um, tell you a little bit about some work that we started now about a decade or so ago, trying to understand how well-being broadly experienced uh, influences our physiology, particularly through the lens of the area that I work in, which is genome regulation, how the life that we lead, the circumstances that we inhabit, the way we make sense of them in our kind of perceptions and experiences and emotional responses, how all of that stuff outside us and in our head gets down into our body and changes the way the human genome works, changes the way our 20,000 genes operate, which ones are on, which ones are off, how active they are when they're on versus not. So as you might imagine, as a NIH-funded researcher, most of my work had focused on stress, adversity, you know, sort of risk factors, and then disease. So, you know, by and large, my whole line of research was essentially like a big evolved recipe for how to take miserable life circumstances and turn them into death. Uh, but it, about 10 years ago, we started asking about how we could potentially block those kinds of effects. What kinds of psychological experiences might we want to cultivate in order to improve health, to prevent adverse life circumstances from impacting the genome in a way that would accelerate disease? So to get started in this, we actually did a uh, collaborative project with a fairly famous happiness researcher, Barb Fredrickson, and uh, took advantage of a study where she was basically surveying people, trying to understand what the correlates of well-being were in, uh, you know, sort of general social behavior and kind of biobehavioral processes, psychophysiology. Um, and she started this with a, a sample of, you know, healthy individuals not exposed to any unusual level of stress. So people from the community at the university where she works, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, and then she she took some blood samples. So we ended up having an opportunity to look at these 80 or so individuals, measure their levels of well-being using a well-established psychometric instrument called the Mental Health Continuum Short Form. If you haven't been um, studying um, this kind of, you know, sort of positive psychology. This is a great, very low intensity, um, you know, sort of scale to begin with because it covers psychological well-being uh, along a lot of the dimensions that Emiliana was uh, you know, alluding to in that definition of, of psychological well-being. Um, but in a relatively short footprint. So we were able to look at, uh, you know, for instance, the two major dimensions that happiness psychologists had been been talking about at the time, eudaimonic well-being, which is a, actually better to start with hedonic well-being, which is just the, the sense of happiness or well-being that comes from having a lot of positive emotional experience. Um, and then this notion of eudaimonic well-being, which is a little bit more tied into um, this, this notion of the well-being that arises from virtue or pursuing something that you find valuable or important in life. So she had 
measured these things. Um, and that gave us a chance to look in these blood samples, uh, basically isolate their white blood cells and profile the expression of all 20,000 human genes to answer the question of what is operating differently in the genome of someone who has, for example, high levels of hedonic well-being or high levels of eudaimonic well-being. Um, so when we did this, and I'm not going to, you know, in the interest of time, I'm not going to drag you through the, the painful details and all the intricate plots, but there were two big stories that came out of this initial sort of first pass look at the genomic correlates of well-being. The first was that uh, there, uh, there were a lot of, you could think of them as risky aspects of molecular biology that were either unaffected or, or more favorably downregulated in association with well-being. But there was one particular coherent set of gene transcripts that was notably more active in people with high levels of well-being. And that was a group of genes involved in uh, defending the body against intracellular pathogens, particularly against viral infections. So these so-called type 1 interferons um, were noticeably tracking in a positive direction with uh, psychological well-being in general. And uh, so you can see in the upper left corner here, if any of you happen to be, you know, genomics researchers of, of any stripe, or at least people who are interested in this, this is a sort of a, a representative set of so-called type 1 interferon response genes. I'll explain more about this type 1 interferon uh, system in a, a moment, but just in concrete sense, particularly people who had high levels of eudaimonic well-being tended to show relatively high activity of these kinds of antiviral genes and comparatively low activity of more risk-related genes, such as um, inflammatory genes. Um, interestingly enough, people with high levels of hedonic well-being, at least relative to their level of eudaimonic well-being, actually showed a considerably different profile. So they actually had noticeably lower levels of type 1 interferon genes. And this struck us as interesting because in general, hedonic and eudaimonic aspects of well-being are pretty correlated. One of the major ways that people get to hedonic well-being is by doing good stuff that they think is important and helps other people and makes the world a better place. So you can think of their, uh, you know, their arrival at hedonic well-being as through a path that involves predominantly eudaimonic activity, doing good stuff for people in the world, self-transcendent stuff. But as we all know, there are more, you know, there's an alternative path to hedonic well-being that's much more kind of consummatory and self-centered and more, um, you know, kind of self-focused, I guess, is the, the best way to put it in terms of feeding your hedonic machinery, um, you know, happy sights, lots of, you know, sort of good feelings, maybe lots of food, smoking, drinking, all that kind of stuff. Um, and even when we controlled for these behavioral mediators of hedonic well-being, it still seemed that people with high levels of eudaimonic well-being relative to their levels of hedonic well-being showed this noticeable uh, sort of bump up in the activity of this one particular molecular system. This turned out to be a surprisingly replicable result that when we initially saw it, we were sort of like, wow, this is weird, interesting new stuff. Who knows you know, how consistent this will be, especially these distinctions between the effects of eudaimonic and hedonic well-being seem kind of intuitively not necessarily what we would have thought of originally from a kind of a emotions go to the brain stem and regulate our physiology standpoint. But nonetheless, this distinction is actually held up in a variety of uh, you know, both replication studies and in a variety of different cultural contexts that actually have very different attitudes towards hedonic well-being versus eudaimonic well-being and collective commitment versus individualism. So that was a kind of an interesting discovery, and it set off, uh, you know, since then about 10 years of work trying to understand how this all comes about and what its likely implications are. So to give you guys a little bit of sense of that, I'll share just a kind of a quick overview of type 1 interferons and what they are. They're basically a set of gene products from genes that are normally silenced, but they get activated when intracellular pattern recognition detectors observe molecules that are characteristic of viral infections, like double-stranded RNA. Human physiological RNA is usually single-stranded, so if there's double-stranded RNA, that's more characteristic of having a virus invading our cells. Um, there's other molecular um, you know, sort of cues for the production of these interferons in response to viral infections. But the big important part is when these genes get turned on, 
they modulate the physiology of the cell in a way that reduces its efficiency as a virus factory. So for instance, it will stabilize the cell membrane and make it much harder for viruses to get into the cell. It will uh, shut down uh, sort of gene transcription in a ways that will prevent viral genomes from being replicated. It will modify all kinds of other aspects of cellular physiology to resist viral infection and pre prevent viruses from productively creating a new virus factory by infecting a given cell. And the interesting thing about these interferons is they affect not just the cell that has detected the virus, but also the surrounding neighboring cells. So this is intentionally designed to produce an antiviral field effect that's relatively localized so that it doesn't destroy the function of our tissues overall, but nonetheless prevents viruses from hopping from one cell to another in the way that they're, they're want to do. Um, they will also engage uh, more distant cells to come in, uh, particularly immune cells, and start the process of responding to the viral infection, either by catalyzing this so-called innate antiviral response that's produced by the cell that's infected itself, or by, for instance, interacting with T lymphocytes and subsequently with B lymphocytes to make antibodies that might neutralize these viruses as they attempt to hop from one cell to another or producing cytotoxic T cells that would actually kill virally infected cells um, and thereby sort of eliminate the virus factories that would otherwise perpetuate the infection. So that was like one of the major observations that arose from this line of work. The other thing that popped out happened to involve the sort of, if you will, specificity, the subdomain of well-being that seemed to track most closely with this kind of antiviral biology. And that really was what we would call the social domain within the broader rubric of eudaimonic well-being. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this notion of social well-being, it was originally sort of pioneered, at least in, in the recent happiness studies literature, by a sociologist working with the uh, sort of the queen of eudaimonic well-being research, Carol Ripps. So, uh, graduate student Corey Keyes actually said, you know, Carol, your theory of, of well-being is very intrapsychic. It's great, obviously, you know, everybody loves this, this sort of careful, thoughtful analysis she did of what constitutes eudaimonic well-being, how it might be distinct in many respects from hedonic well-being, uh, at least in the consummatory sense. But Carol's view really was shaped by what you could think of as existentialist uh, psychotherapy uh, and existentialist philosophy, more broadly speaking, um, which was very focused on individual experience and sort of interpretation and response to the world. And Corey's observation was that how we relate to others actually in the real world is a big source of whether we're feeling happy and well or whether we're feeling threatened and challenged. So instead of just you know, sort of dividing well-being into, let's say, these arbitrary, you know, sort of divisions of hedonic and eudaimonic well-being. He said, you know, we really need to think about sources of eudaimonic well-being as involving both psychological well-being in the sense that Carol had been studying, um, as well as social well-being in the sense that essentially sociologists had been studying all the way back at least to Durkheim and this idea of feeling alienated from society and the people around you with the uh, sort of um, transformation of social structures that took place during industrialization. So here's a little, you know, sort of sampling of the actual item content that somebody would endorse to show high levels of social well-being. They would feel like they have something important to contribute to society, that they, they belong to a community like a social group or a neighborhood. They would feel like that social group or a neighborhood is a good place in general for human beings and perhaps even becoming better over time. Um, and that this is all a kind of coherent, understandable thing. In other words, the society is not this overwhelming, you know, stressor that uh, leaves us feeling oppressed. So this raised this interesting question for us about why there would be this connection between this sort of highly social strand or flavor of well-being and this kind of antiviral biology. And one idea that sprang to mind was that this might represent what we could think of as a microbial form of allostatic physiology. So before the idea of allostatic load really took hold, the folks like Peter Sterling, who generated the, the basic you know, sort of theory of the allostatic physiology, really wanted to distinguish uh, allostasis as a forward-looking 
you know, sort of adaptation to the brain's projections about the challenges that the body might face and distinguish that from more traditional conceptions of homeostasis, which had a, a sort of a, a much le less, you can think of it as a more brainless approach to physiology that said physiological parameters are waiting to get disturbed and then physiology will push back to maintain some homeostatic set point. So the key idea that Peter Sterling and the allostatic psychophysiologists had was that actually many times physiology adapts to what our brain thinks is going to happen before it even impacts the body. So this idea that there might be a relationship between the social experience that we have in our brain and our immune system might represent the immune system using information from the brain and the nervous system to sort of shape what kind of a response it's going to make to optimally resist pathogens. And in the work that we had been doing on the negative side, we had already formulated this idea that, you know, when we're feeling alone, isolated, threatened, um, that in general, that traffics with physical injury. Human beings, you know, as, as a species, their entire life history strategy is formed around groups overcoming adversity that would otherwise destroy individuals. So that when individuals are isolated or threatened in other ways, they might pivot their physiology to deal with the kind of injuries and the pathogens associated with that that come from this increased sense of danger or this increased exposure to physical wounding, for example. The pathogens that kill us when we're wounded are generally bacteria that are either injected into the sterile tissues of our body by, you know, from our skin or the tooth of the saber-toothed tiger or a spear, or that are liberated from our gut or something like that. But the big sort of pathogen signature from the immune system standpoint that traffics with threat or danger is really, um, you know, sort of particularly pronounced in the, the realm of bacterial infections, which require a certain kind of immune response that we can broadly characterize as pro-inflammatory. The flip side of that, the sort of default state, it looks like, at least back in our hunter-gatherer days, you know, now this is not so clear that the default state is feeling attached and safe. Probably the default state is a mild level of anxiety and concern all the time. But once upon a time, that was not the case, thankfully. Um, and so the dominant portion of a, a human being's life was spent in a relatively, you know, sort of tight social group that all knew one another and uh, had all these benefits from working together, but were exposed to one major kind of microbial risk that capitalizes on social contact, and that is viral infections. Unlike bacteria, which live on rocks and teeth and stuff like that, viruses, as we're all reminded recently from the pandemic, you know, intrinsically travel from one host to another through social contact. They can't survive uh, really anywhere without, you know, sort of some that basically uh, hopping from one virus producing host to another virally susceptible host. So sociality uh, has all these amazing benefits to human beings, but it creates a super highway for this one particular kind of pathogen that capitalizes on social contact to spread and reproduce. So we theorized that perhaps what was happening is the human body, as we became, you know, essentially evolved from, you know, sort of earlier mammalian, uh, you know, progenitors to the hominids that we are today, as we became more and more social, uh, we became more and more vulnerable to viral infections. And as a result, the immune system in general, uh, you know, sort of developed, a, a, initially we, we hypothesized a default antiviral stance. But later, um, you know, we started asking this question about how the physiology of the body that's going to regulate these genes actually detects our social conditions. And we realized that this might not be a default. It actually might be an active physiological process that essentially sort of in a thermometer sense quantifies our degree of social engagement or attachment or embeddedness at any given point in time and generates a neural signal that will make its way into the vicinity of an immune cell to change its gene expression profiles. And the biggest insight we had from this came from taking these theories of social signal transduction that we'd initially developed for the threat world of negative psychology, how social processes regulate the genome, for example, by changing brain function, altering autonomic physiology, 
generating neuroeffector molecules in the vicinity of um, immune cells, which then go, you know, signal into those immune cells to actually mechanically change the transcription of these particular genes. So we had mapped how this happened in the negative side. We started asking whether something similar might be happening on the positive side, particularly in the context of pro-social experience or social connection. So here you can kind of see a, a representation of the autonomic nervous system in its classic sense, that um, sympathetic trunk marked in gold there, of course, is the fight or flight signaling pathway that moves uh, perceptions of threat into changes in physiology throughout the body. The classic sort of rest and digest version of the parasympathetic nervous system, much more associated with relaxation, uh, mindfulness, you know, sort of uh, contemplative, healthy, generative, vegetative states is um, highlighted in red there. But what was interesting to us as we were thinking about this is there was another wing of the parasympathetic nervous system that Steve Porges and some, some others, uh, Nathan Fox, folks like that, had been talking about for years as what they hypothesized to be an intrinsically social contact promoting characteristic of human autonomic physiology. In other words, these nerves they felt had evolved relatively recently in the, the kind of the, the hierarchy of you know, species differentiation that eventually led to human beings and these kind of pro-social um, hominids and, and primates and even lower order um, uh, mammals. But this, as you could see, these organisms evolving more social life history strategies, they tended to also evolve more elaborate versions of this green highlighted so-called supradiaphragmatic wing of the vagus nerve. And you can see from its distribution there, its major uh, sort of output is towards uh, facial structures, uh, mostly related to musculature expression, that kind of thing, also related to uh, oral biology in ways that turn out to be relevant to sociality. Um, these are going to play a major role in re reproductive biology and especially in caregiving for infants. But there's another wing that also reaches down to the cardiovascular system and, in fact, uh, also to the respiratory system and allows for some crosstalk between how our hearts and lungs are working and how our level of stress physiology might essentially be inhibited or reversed from fight or flight physiology. So this is what the system actually looks like in sort of a, you know, sort of pencil drawing version. You can see this heavy, rich, you know, sort of innervation of the face and then these, these sort of descending tracts that go to the heart and lungs. Um, so we started, uh, you know, picking up on this idea that Steve and others had had that, you know, this is really a system wired to promote states of caregiving and bonding and that these are known to play a significant role in mother infant um, interaction, particularly in nursing and the kinds of, so you can think of them as shared psychophysiology that mothers and children have, um, but that these, these kinds of physiological affordances, um, these theorists say, can be generalized. In other words, we can hook up this basic caregiving physiology that's enabled by the supradiaphragmatic vagus nerve to um, implicate it in caring for other things besides our project, like caring for our, our spouse, caring for our neighbors, caring for our community. Eventually, perhaps with this fancy cortex we have, hooking it up to very abstract conceptual symbolic features that will still end up creating states of, you can think of them as parasympathetically mediated eudaimonic well-being in a very material biochemical sense in the body. So what turned out to be interesting, there's a, a, a more or less accidental uh, coincidence of a number of different studies that had looked at one index of parasympathetic nervous system activity that is read out through changes in heart rate that coincide with changes in respiration. And the reason that this is an interesting index of parasympathetic activity is that this feedback from our respiratory system to our cardiovascular system is known to be mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system. So the extent of, you can think of it, the extent of cross-correlation between respiration and heart rate variability um, is a kind of a, like a key index of the strength of sympathetic activity. Um, so we find this correlates quite well 
with increased antiviral biology and it shows no correlation whatsoever with some of the other aspects of physiology that we've been studying like inflammatory biology. So this led us to um, start interrogating the role of uh, parasympathetic biology as a potential mediator of social well-being at the same time as we were trying to develop protocols to actually um, you know, sort of promote social well-being. So I'm going to go through this kind of stuff pretty quickly because my time is growing short here. But the upshot is there's a number of different paradigms where we've had people engage in pro-social caregiving activity, like, for instance, this generation exchange program that Teresa seem in a, a, a you know, very uh, creative gerontological psychophysiologist um, masquerading as a social epidemiologist had uh, developed, where she basically gets all these grandmas from South Central LA to go into the local school systems and serve as teaching aides. And you can see here, uh, when they do that over the nine month school year, their antiviral biology pops up very nicely and stays elevated for nine months. Um, uh, that is a, a delight to us because in fact, the biggest challenge we have in all behavioral interventions isn't changing physiology transiently, it's producing durable changes in physiology. And this uh, was remarkable, not just in generating sort of 10 to 20% improvements in this kind of antiviral molecular biology, but being so impressively durable over months. Um, again, this seemed to be relatively specific to antiviral biology, wasn't affecting other aspects of the immune system in an upregulatory sense, and in fact had favorable effects in downregulating riskier profiles of physiology, such as inflammation. Um, recently, we bumped into the same phenomena when we were studying the effects of lockdown uh, in monkeys. Accidentally, we didn't realize we were doing this quite at the time, but right as the pandemic broke out and news media were asking us, what do we know about the effects of lockdown on you know, human psychological well-being and its interface with physiological well-being? We realized we'd, we'd accidentally done something of an animal model of this, where we had taken uh, rhesus macaques from these big uh, 80 to 100 animal field cage settings, put them in uh, their own isolated monkey apartment, actually a, a duplex apartment, so they had plenty of space and toys, and saw what we typically see, sort of a reduction in the uh, prevalence of the monocytes that are actually carrying this antiviral biology in our white blood cell pool, a reduction in the, the per cell activity of these type 1 interferons. Interestingly, when we took those monkeys, put them back in their field cage, and then put them back in lockdown again, but this time had them do that and, and discover that there was basically a, a little kid monkey in the cage next to them. That largely abrogated these effects of lockdown. There are lots of other lockdown physiology effects that were not abrogated, but the one notable difference when there was a you, you were locked down with a kid, basically, was that this type 1 interferon system that's involved in protecting us against viral infections was not only preserved, but in many respects enhanced above baseline levels. Um, so much so that uh, this incurred not just in, in blood markers, but we could, for instance, take lymph nodes out of these monkeys, these key tissues where immune systems generate their responses, and see more antiviral biology in the lymph node, less inflammatory biology. And this added up to a remarkable effect on the total amount of viral activity in the bodies of these animals. So as you probably know, we're all infected by viruses all of our lives. Most of them don't cause disease. Most of them are just kind of latently hanging out in our body doing things. But what we observed in these monkeys is that when we partnered them with somebody that they cared about, some appealing, you know, generativity inspiring little junior monkey partner, um, the total amount of antiviral biology went up in their body and reciprocally the total amount of viral activity in their body, viral gene expression, dropped notably um, in complement. So the take home points I'll leave you with is that well-being is linked to enhanced type 1 interferon biology in the immune system. This seems to be particularly connected to the social aspects of well-being, which are some of the major sources of experienced well-being. It's possibly an immunologic adaptation to one of the risks that comes with the many benefits of sociality, and that is predation by social pathogens. Um, this seems to involve the parasympathetic nervous system as, if you will, a social sort of information transmission system into physiology. And this really, um, I think, starts to motivate us to think about mind-body connection, not just in this stress or threat fight or flight 
concept that was you know, sort of popularized by Walter Cannon, um, but also in terms of these intrinsic neural adaptations to sociality of the sort that, for instance, Steve Forges has been theorizing. So uh, with that, let me leave you with the idea that uh, John Stuart Mill advanced that, you know, it's really the people who are most happy are the ones that have their minds fixed on some object other than their own happiness. They're focused more on the happiness of others or the improvement of mankind. This suggests those might also be the most healthy individuals as well. So thanks for your time. Thanks to all the folks that made these studies happen. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Steve. That was a wonderful talk. And we're really, um, yeah, we're really glad to have had you here uh, to join us today. Um, I'm going to let some of the Q&As uh, filter in, although I'll note that we're already getting comments on how fascinating and wonderful um, your talk uh, was. So thank you so much. Um, so uh, one question that I have for you is, um, so while I wait for questions to, to filter in, this interesting, um, you know, uh, parasympathetic, a nervous system and vagal, um, the, the vagal nerve as um, being a mediator. But I'm wondering, um, you know, thinking from a, an intervention perspective, I've seen in the reading that you sent out, there is a, a comment about how interventions to improve vagal activity um, could be potentially promising. But then that would suggest that maybe that this is a causal uh, process. And I'm sort of wondering, you know, where, where do you see is the best point to intervene um, here to try to uh, potentially amplify uh, the, the uh, sh should we be focusing on upstream and social well-being um, could, or are there quick and easy ways with vagal activity? There probably are. I mean, we're, it's, you know, it's early days, so nobody should just, you know, sort of take what I'm about to say and say, oh, this is well-developed science and go out and do it and assume, for instance, it's going to, you know, cure your diseases or optimize your immune system. So, you know, let, let me start by saying, like I said, these are, are, you know, very kind of provisional observations, but there's at least two things that have worked in an experimental sense so far for modifying this antiviral biology through, it appears, this kind of social and or vagal activity. One of them involves, uh, you can think of it as essentially parasympathetic biofeedback. So uh, for time reasons, I didn't get a chance to get into this too much, but Mara Mather at USC did this study that initially to me seemed crazy, but it actually worked. She randomized people to essentially uh, sort of increase their heart rate variability. And that's like, she literally gave them heart rate variability as a sort of like a one number parameter that they would then do biofeedback on. Um, and they weren't given any instructions about how to modulate this parameter. They were just told they should modulate this thing. And actually people were surprisingly successful at increasing their parasympathetic nervous system activity, their respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Um, probably a lot of them did that by you know, implicitly at least learning that respiratory control and any of the psychological stress reduction processes that might afford that as an outcome would have this, this impact. But what was remarkable is that the people that were randomized to increase their heart rate variability showed increases in this antiviral biology from, you know, baseline to follow up over several weeks of intervention. So one possible answer is like just direct classical kind of psychophysiology biofeedback. This seems weird. I have, you know, there's lots more to unpack about what these people were doing, but that's one potential answer where, yes, we can randomize people is clearly a causal effect. The other thing that we can do is we can randomize people to pro-social engagements of some sort or another. So there's this um, sort of random acts of kindness protocol that Sonia Lubomirsky uses, and that's actually proven effective now in several studies in uh, sort of reducing inflammatory biology while at the same time enhancing this antiviral biology. So that we presume, at least possibly, might also be operating through this parasympathetic pathway, but we can't be sure because we haven't directly measured the parasympathetic nervous system's activity in the context of these acts of kindness study. But there, to make a long story short, there's probably pro-social protocols that will uh, sort of, you know, activate these presumably parasympathetic systems, and then this more direct to parasympathetic approach that also seems to be effective. <laughs> 
Great, thank you. We have a question from our audience and uh, I'm going to, to um, say this and then actually add on to it. So the question is how these positive processes operate in the context of adversity. And I'm gonna broaden that a little bit more. Um, so so um, in, in the context of adversity and potential reversibility um, uh, of adversity or the impl implications of adversity. Great question. So um, th the best answer actually comes from another monkey study that we did in collaboration with Steve Sumi, where, you know, as you guys probably know, Steve Sumi uh, for years has studied the effects of early life adversity on physiology and behavior, broadly speaking. The way he models early adversity is taking monkeys that have just been born and putting them in a cage with a bunch of other newborn and and you know sort of youngster monkeys which sounds cute but is really sort of like a low-grade version of the lord of the flies because like it's a completely unstructured environment there's chaos all the time day and night there's monkeys flying around it's just nuts and so it's very difficult to form like a stable set of attachments and a uh, sort of like to have even any social stabilization of the the you know sort of the world so that it becomes more kind of predictable and um you know, for lack of a better term, uh, calming and, and parasympathetic. So he does that for um, basically, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact amount of time. I think it's like a, a couple, you know, se several months to maybe a couple of years or something like that. And that produces classic portraits at the molecular profile of physiological risk. These look like you know, at the molecular and, and physiological level, a lot like what we see in humans who are subject to early life adversity, ACEs, that kind of thing. Um, and in our, our, you know, sort of molecular analysis at the level of genomics, we can see exactly this sort of reduction in antiviral biology, this increase in inflammatory biology that tends to traffic with risk. Our big interest in this is what happens at the end of that period? So Steve generally doesn't talk a lot about this, but for basic ethical reasons, they're not allowed to do this for the animal's whole life because it's actually too bad for their physiology and sort of psychological and behavioral well-being. So at some point, these animals get taken out of the Lord of the Flies cage and put back into a normal social system for monkeys with you know their, their parents, but friends, you know, a stable social hierarchy, all this kind of thing. So my deep interest in this is what happens to those monkeys when they go back into a more stable, you know, sort of um, healthy social environment. So in this st study, we found, you know, literally, I can't remember the exact number, but it's something like six to 700 genes just in immune cells that start functioning noticeably different, like completely outside the 95% range of normal variability. Um, in the animals exposed to adversity. These are pretty um, persistent effects. And then when the animals get returned to stable, predictable social environments, it turns out more than 90% of those genes revert back into the normal range of variation. So the picture I come up with is that there is substantial reversibility of this. If you can change social environments for the better, there will be predominantly recovery and resilience in response to that in terms of internal molecular physiology. Now, there's still some things that were permanently, you know, sort of deviated by adversity. So I don't mean to say all bad stuff goes away, but at 90 to 95% plus, you know, the resilience will happen more or less normally if you go back to an abiding, supportive, you know, coherent um, communal social life at least in this, this particular paradigm. So obviously we can't guarantee this for every possible version of adversity in human beings, but my impression is that resilience is more the rule than the exception. And I think that gives us hope because you know one of the things we were dealing with at this time was this idea that maybe my DNA is gonna get methylated and I'll be imprinted the rest of my life and I'm cursed by my, my early life. And so why even try to make things better? Well, it, it turns out, you know, it, even small amounts of making things better filters down into your body remarkably quickly and can make a difference. Now, there's one caveat I can bring up to this, and that is even the monkeys, after they were returned to stable social environments, they still showed more variability over time than monkeys that had always lived in stable social environments. So it does look 
like early adversity creates a persistent, you can think of it as sort of neurobiological hypersensitivity or twitchiness in response to threatening um, external conditions, uh, probably also in response to positive, you know, favorable external social conditions. They seem more neurobiologically reactive, both positively and negatively, but their norm is still solidly within the healthy range. So there's probably are persisting effects of these early adversities that don't go away, but, um, you know, we still ought to do what we can to normalize and, and make, you know, healthy these kinds of social conditions, just because the vast majority of biological risk does seem to respond favorably to that. Yeah, and so if, if the monkeys, I mean, this is totally putting you on the spot um, and not necessarily what the experiment did, but just postulating. So if there was some way to increase the feelings that the eudaimonia or the social well-being in that unstable environment, what, what would you expect might happen? Well, I mean, you know, obviously we hope that that would start normalizing the physiology even in that unstable environment. So to some extent, that's what we were doing with the monkey lockdown study is we were creating, uh, you know, sort of a, a weird, stressful social environment that is the environment of isolation, and then reintroducing what turns out to be the primatologist's favorite trick for that Sumi manipulation. The, the primatologist actually developed the infant caregiving paradigm specifically to deal with the monkeys that seem to have gotten really messed up by the kinds of things that Har Harry Harlow was doing. So Harry actually determined that love was the antidote to abuse and isolation, but that it's very hard to actually engage the, the sort of restorative psychophysiology through what we would think of as peer relations, in part because these individuals that were subject to social adversity for a long period of time tend to be hard to get along with because they're they're wired for threat and reactivity. Um, so, but what he found is that they could get along with infants and they weren't abusive. In fact, the, it's like the infant was so charming that they could kind of break through the acquired sense of threat. And the fact that the infant itself is not a peer and therefore is much less threatening is probably a key element of this. So I think you know, one thing that we keep thinking about is how can we both increase eudaimonic engagement and reduce threat and do that in ways that are kind of synergistic. And one of the easiest kind of, you you, you know, you get two for the price of one is doing pro-social activity for younger people, intergenerational um, uh, interventions, helping interventions of that sort. Great, thanks. So um, just one more follow-up question that we've actually received from two different um, attendees is a question about uh, this potential um, reversibility. Is this age dependent or is there a critical developmental period in which you, this, you think that it's important that this might happen? Well, you know, with my empirical scientist hat, I can tell you we don't know because we just haven't done these kinds of, uh, you know, sort of parametric comparison studies. But, uh, you know, stepping back more into a kind of like a social epidemiology, social psychophysiology hat where we don't have exactly the randomized comparisons, we can still look at older people and see favorable effects. So remember that that generation exchange program, we were looking at, you know, 50 to, to, to 80 year old old predominantly women um, in, you know, a relatively adverse socioeconomic, um, you know, context, and they were still showing these very favorable changes in antiviral biology that onset was in, in months and persisted for at least nine months. So I don't think that there's a point in the age spectrum where it becomes impossible to have these effects. Great. Thank you so much, sure, Steve. We pleasure. really appreciate it. There are some more questions in the Q&A, so if you um, have a moment to type answers to those, I'm sure that uh, those attendees would really appreciate it. I'll give it. it a try. Thanks. Thanks.